Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. My name is Jan Wolf van der Meer. I'm an editor of Femmes Microbiology Reviews. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to this webinar on antigenic organisms. Uh, FEMS, as you may know, is the Federation of European Microbiological Societies uh, that invests in science using the income from our journals to fund charitable activities and support the community. We provide grants as well to scientists to organize and support conferences and sponsor a wide range of events such as this webinar series today. The FEMS webinars provide a forum for the presentation and discussion of key research, enabling the flow of ideas to continue despite the current cancellation of in-person events and conferences. The series has been ongoing since June 2020. If you missed any of the previous sessions, you can uh, watch the recordings on the FEMS YouTube channel. So, it's my pleasure to introduce both speakers of today. We have Volker Muller, who is a professor in, uh, at the Department of Molecular Bio Microbiology and Bioenergetics at the Institute of Molecular Biosciences from the Johann Wolfgang Goethe University in Frankfurt. His specialty is metabolism and biochemistry of anaerobic microorganisms their metabolic engineering, halophilic organisms, and bioprocess engineering. Then there is Afan Islam. He is an assistant professor lecturer in biochemical engineering in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Loughborough University in Leicestershire in the UK. And his specialty is biochemical bioprocess engineering, metabolic engineering, systems biology, and synthetic biology. So by accident, those two gentlemen will find themselves uh, today on this webinar because they both approached FEMS microbiology reviews with uh, reviews on acetogenic organisms. And these two uh, reviews, they centered on the problem of replacing bulk chemicals from petroleum sources to uh, different sources. And one of the uh, organisms or the group of organisms that may be interesting for this are acetogenic microbes um, that could potentially also help to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases if we manage to actually change the petroleum based economy to something that is a more plant based bioeconomy. And with the metabolites that are produced by these organisms, we can potentially create a new chemistry. And particularly interesting is also the group of acetogenic bacteria because they can use mixtures of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and hydrogen for the production of acetate and ethanol. So the two webinars that we will hear today will focus on the one hand on the interesting and fascinating biochemistry and bioprocess engineering perspectives of acetogenic microorganisms and on the other hand on the potential by synthetic biology and genetic manipulation to improve such strains for bioprocess technology. Uh, the webinar uh, will proceed as follows. We have both speakers, first Volker Müller, then uh, Asan Islam, uh, each for about 20 minutes. And after we've heard from the two speakers, we'll open the floor for discussions. You can submit your questions to the, um, the online tool where I will see them and then I can pick from those questions and ask the gentleman to reply to them and discuss this. So you can pose your questions anytime during the session. They will appear in the question window that I can see and from there I can pose them then afterwards to both speakers. I hope you will enjoy both seminars. It is my pleasure now to give the floor to Volker Müller. Please, Volker. Thank you very much, Jan, for this uh, very nice introduction into the topic and the introduction of the speakers. Uh, it's my, my great pleasure to give you a summary of the uh, recent paper uh, published uh, by Florian Kremp, my PhD student and myself in FEMS Microbiological Reviews on methanol and methyl group conversion and acetogens, biochemistry, physiology and application. As you can imagine, in a 15 to 20 minutes talk, one can only highlight some glimpses of the review and you are uh, invited to check out the review for further details. So the acetogenic bacteria are characterized by a specific pathway, the Wood-Jungner pathway of CO2 fixation, which is a two-branched linear pathway in which two molecules of CO2 are converted to one molecule of acetyl-CoA. In the methyl branch of the pathway, CO2 is uh, first reduced to formic acid 
and formic acid is then bound in an ATP dependent reaction to the cofactor tetrahydrofolic acid, a common C1 carrier in uh, U and uh, prokaryotes. The formule group is bound to tetrahydrofolic acid, and then you can see the intermediates here. It's subsequently water is split off, and then it is reduced via the methanol, the methylene to the methyl intermediate. So at the end of this reaction sequence of reduction, a methyl group is produced from a CO2. Then there's one more reaction to prepare the methyl group for condensation, which is the transfer of the methyl group to another protein, the coronoid iron sulfur protein. In the um, carboxyl branch, the second molecule of CO2 is reduced to carbon monoxide, which is enzyme bound. And on the enzyme acetyl-CoA synthase CO dehydrogenase, the structure of which is shown here on the right hand side, the two moieties CO and the methyl group and CoA are condensed to acetyl-CoA. The next step then is the production of acetyl phosphate by phosphotransacetylase. And then the last step, the production of acetate and ATP. So this pathway is used by acetogens, but also by methanogens and sulfate reducers. And acetogens can also grow by using this pathway and by using reduction of CO2 with hydrogen. So acetogens are autotrophic and they convert hydrogen and CO2 to acetate. And this goes along with a free energy change of only 95 kilojoule per mole of an acetate. So how much is that? Uh, to make an ATP, standard textbook knowledge in biochemistry is uh, 60 kilojoules. So that is enough for roughly 1.5 ATP per mole of an acetate. So this is not very much if you compare that, for example, to the aerobic respiration that our mitochondria perform. And now if you go into the anaerobic ecosystems where these bugs live in, there's not a lot of hydrogen. There's not one molar of hydrogen around. So these concentrations have been measured to be around micromolar range. And then the delta G is only minus 20 kilojoule per molar of an acetate. And this is at the so-called thermodynamic edge of life. And this gives only 0.3 molar of ATP per molar of acetate. And our group was interested in the last uh, uh, decades, one can say, how this pathway is coupled to the synthesis of ATP. And I'm here depicting the Wood-Jungler pathway again on the right-hand side. And now we have here a cell surrounding the Wood-Jungler pathway. And now you see that one ATP is generated in the acetic kinase, but one ATP is um, hydrolyzed uh, here in the formate activation step. So the overall ATP gain is zero. So the big question was for decades, how is this pathway coupled to the synthesis of ATP? And it must be coupled to the synthesis of ATP because these bugs grow on it. Electron comes from hydrogen and these bugs have a hydrogenase that is electron bifurcating, means that electrons are split, split. One electron goes up energetically downhill, in this case to NAD, and this energy is used to pump up the other electron uphill to ferredoxin. If you now look at the uh, electron sources, hydrogen in this reaction, the first reaction, NAD here, NAD here, and ferredoxin here, there's a misbalance. There is more ferredoxin than NAD, and therefore these cells need a redox balancing system, and this redox balancing system is membrane bound. Actually, it's a membrane bound ion translocating um, enzyme. It's called in acetobacterium woody RNF. But there is another one in other acetogens, which is an energy converting hydrogenase. So both systems use reduced ferredoxin, and the electron is transferred to NAD in the case of RNF, or to a proton in the case of um, the ACH complex. And this little energy between these two pairs is used to pump out sodium, thus creating a potential. And this ion potential is then used to drive the synthesis of ATP. I would say that this system is essential, of course, to make ATP during autotrophic growth, but it's also equally important and essential for redox balancing. So if you now do the overall calculations, and this is published a couple of years ago in Nature Reviews Microbiology, you end up with 0.3 ATP per mole of an ATP, which fits very well to what I've just shown you before. So let's have a look again at the pathway. The pathway from CO2 
and CO2 to acetyl-CoA. This pathway is very well suited for the conversion of other C1 components. Another C1 component is carbon monoxide. Some of them, not all, some of the acetogens grow on carbon monoxide, some of them grow on carbon monoxide and CO2 and hydrogen. Together, this mixture is called synthesis gas or syngas, and that is used in industry at the moment uh, on an industrial level for the production of uh, ethanol. Another compound which is highly interesting for applications is formic acid, formate, which goes into the pathway at the level of formate, as I described before. Formaldehyde can be used by resting cells, but it's highly toxic, so it's not a real good growth substrate. But a real good growth substrate is methanol. Methanol is used by a couple of uh, acetogens, and you see here the uh, example that goes from acetobacterium to clostridium to eubacterium, and here you see the old Morella thermoacetica discovered by my good old friend uh, Stephen Daniel in 1980 that the growth on methanol, you see Spuromusa and you see thermoacetogenium feo. So there's a couple of acetogens that grow very well on methanol. So what is required for an acetogen to grow on methanol? It is required to transfer the methyl group into the central pathway. The final acceptor is THF, and the donor in this case is methanol. For the conversion of the methyl group into the central pathway, three proteins are required. First, methyl transferase one that abstracts the methyl group from methanol and transfers to the second protein, which is a coronoid protein, and the cobalt atom in the coronoid protein, that is methylated, giving rise to methyl coronoid 3. And now the third protein, which is called MT2, methyl transferase 2, demethylates the methyl coronoid 3 to give rise to methyl tetrahydrofolic acid. Um, these three proteins can be three distinct proteins, but they can also be encoded by only two genes with two of these domains being present on one polypeptide chain. So we've cloned uh, and analyzed and identified the methyl transferase uh, genes for methanol in acetobacterium woolii. You can see those here, MT1, COP, MT2. And then there's another couple of genes which are related to regulation and which are related to assembly, storage, transfer of the uh, cobalt atom and the coronoid. And this gene cluster is highly uh, conserved among different acetogens. So if you now take methyltransferase 1 as a query and check how many of these methyltransferases are actually present in different acetogens, you will end up with a surprise. And the surprise is shown here for our pet acetobacterium woodii. In yellow is MT1, and you see there's many MT1 enzymes, genes, that have no MT2 or COP counterpart. There's a number of um, solo MT1 enzymes encoded in the genome, meaning that there's a number of MT1 enzymes that share common MT2 COP protein systems. And this means there's a treasure for hidden growth substrates. Only a few substrates have been identified for these uh, different uh, methyl transferases. So what could be the substrates of these methyl transferases? So far, I discussed methanol. Uh, a possible substrate is methyl sulfide, and this has been shown by Theo Hansen's group a long time ago that methyl sulfides can be used as methyl group donor. Um, N methyl groups, for example, coming from glycine betaine, our pet acetobacterium woodii grows on glycine betaine. And interestingly enough, it only takes uh, this, <laughs> this part of the glycine betaine actually missing over here, sorry, uh, but it only, actually only takes uh, uh, one methyl group and not the second and not the third. So it demethylates glycine betaine to demethyl glycine. And there's more of these N methyl groups found in nature. And the biggest group that donates methyl groups from acetogens are these aromatic compounds that derive from lignin and from pectin degradation, as shown years ago by Bernard Schink and uh, Tsaikos. And uh, two representatives are shown here tree methoxybenzoate, which has methoxy groups, and ferrolate, which has a methoxy group here. So the very high number of different MT1 enzymes in the Cetobacterium woodii 
implies that methyl groups are most likely the most preferred substrate for this, at least this is cetogen in nature. So how are these methyl groups now converted? I discussed the wood Jungler pathway and I discussed with you the reduction of CO2. Of course, the methyl group is highly reduced and to convert the methyl group, you have to generate electrons first. So the methyl group coming from methyl X, and it's very important here to note, methyl X can be methyl um, hydroxyl, so methanol, methyl sulfide, methyl uh, bound to N or uh, methoxy groups. That doesn't matter at all. So the product in this pathway is at the end methyl tetrahydrofolic acid. Methyl tetrahydrofolic acid is now oxidized by the same pathway that I described before in the reductive direction. Here it goes in the oxidative direction, generating hydrogen, NADH, and NADH. And these electrons now have to be disposed. And they are disposed by reducing CO2 to CO in the second reaction. So this is a reduction reaction. And here we know in any acetogen uh, analyze, the reductant is always the same, it's always reduced ferrodoxin. So now we need a system to convert electrons from hydrogen and NAD to ferrodoxin. And this is made again by the redox balancing system. And you see here in this example, now the electron transport chain goes backwards. It's no longer an ATP synthesizing system. Now it is an ATP utilizing system. ATP is hydrolyzed, generating a potential, and this potential drives the energetic uphill transport of electrons from NAD to ferrodoxin. And now in the last step, when the uh, um, electrons have been balanced, the, the carbon monoxide and the methyl group are condensed in module number four, the condensation module to acetyl-CoA. And this has been uh, worked out by our group for uh, acetobacterium woody eye and another uh, few other acetogens and you can check out the review. Uh, we have all these figures for all the different acetogens in that review and at the end you can of course calculate the amount of ATP produced and you see here for woody eye it's 0.83 ATP per mole of an acetate compared to 0.3 when they grow on H2 CO2 so methanol is energetically clearly preferred over H2 and CO2. And now I would like to play around with you a little bit. I've discussed the energetics, the modules, and now I will show you that methanol metabolism is highly fascinating. That's one of the most fascinating metabolism that acetogens have because you can play Lego with the oxidation module, with the reduction module, and can combine and delete and create new pathways. First, if you only take the oxidation module and then produce from all the electrons that are generated any uh, hydrogen, then the hydrogen is released in the ecosystem. And this is thermodynamically unfavorable and only works if the hydrogen concentration is rather low. And this can be achieved by co-cultivating acetogens on methanol with a hydrogen-consuming partner, for example, a methanogen, like methanospirillum hungartii, as shown by Kurt Rubisch and Olivier, but also others, again, uh, with methanol shown by Theo Hansen and others. So this is um, uh, known for a long time that these bugs can grow non-acetogenically. They do not produce acetate anymore, but they produce hydrogen, and the hydrogen is used by the um, uh, partner. So another interesting thing is to exchange the reduction module. So you take the oxidation module, and now we no longer reduce CO2. So these cells are no longer CO2 reducing, but they can reduce, for example, this stuff here, which is called caffeate, that also comes from, lignin, uh, from pectin degradation and uh, lignin degradation. And what you see here is it has a double bond. So if you close both eyes and open one slowly, 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 looks a little bit like fumarate. And what these cells do is they reduce this double bond to then hydrocaffeate, and that's all they can do. They cannot eat the stuff, they can just reduce it and take caffeate as electron acceptors. Therefore, uh, we and others, Bach and Fennig, were the first to describe this, and we discovered the type of uh, 
respiration mechanism. So this is called cafe aid respiration. And now it goes further. These bugs can grow mixotrophically. And now we can exchange the entire oxidation module. So you see there's no methanol oxidation anymore. And the electrons we can provide, for example, by hydrogen, by fructose, by diode, by any other compound. And these substances are oxidized. And then the electrons are used to reduce CO2. And then acetate is formed. So here, no oxidation module anymore, no methanol oxidation anymore. And you can go again one step further and delete the entire oxidation as well as reduction module. And then you have a situation like this, methanol and carbon monoxide. Actually, these bugs perform a cetogenesis from methanol and carbon monoxide. And you see there's no longer any redox reaction involved. There's no electron transport chain, but there's a very high ATP yield. Uh, this ATP by substrate level phosphorylation here uh, while acetate is formed. So this is the fascinating aspect on the physiology of uh, uh, cetogens. You can play around with different modules and you can create, let's say, new pathways by creating new modules. And this is what is, makes a cetogen so interesting for biotechnology. And as you've heard in the introduction by Professor Van der Meer, these bugs are already used in industry. And Professor Islam will talk about that more in the next talk. And they are used to um, uh, use hydrogen CO2 and carbon monoxide syngas to produce lactate, acetate, bioplastics at the beginning, isoprene, there's one um, a publication or 3 hydroxypropionic acid. The problem in industry when you grow these cells on these gases is gas fermentation. A low solubility of these gases um, and a very bad mass transfer into the system. This could be improved by using methanol or formate. And actually methanol and formate can be produced easily by chemical means from, for example, synthesis gas. So methanol and formate as well are very promising alternatives for the industrial uh, usage of acetogens uh, while avoiding gas fermentation. I discussed the upper part. The upper part is essential to know if you want to do um, biotechnology. I told you that the ATP yield has a maximum of 1.7 and if you use methanol only, it has only 0.8 ATP per mole of, uh, per mole of uh, methanol. So if you want to produce a compound like isoprene, which requires uh, 6 ATP, there's no way to get isoprene as a pure compound at the end of the day. So for um, metabolic engineering, it is very important to know the biochemistry of these production pathways and to know exactly the electron carriers involved and the ATP demand. And this is what we have outlined in our review for different uh, acetogens. For example, here is Eurobacterium limosum, but we also have Acetobacterium woodii, we have Clostridium dalii, and others in our um, um, review. And then we, we have uh, methanol as a substrate. And then we outline the biosynthesis of different biotechnological interesting compounds from methanol. And just as an example, here is butyrate butanol formation from methanol by eubacterium. And I'm not going into detail because there's uh, not uh, enough time to do that. Um, check this out in our review. Florian Kremp did wonderful figures on all these metabolic schemes, easy to follow, easy to calculate. And uh, when you calculate this, you end up with, yes, butyrate formation from methanol should be possible on paper. And then we actually do the experiment. This was done by my PhD student, Dennis Litty, just published a couple of weeks ago, Microbial Biotechnology. Eubacterium limosum grows on methanol that has been described before. And it produces, indeed, produces butyrate uh, um, from methanol. So the calculations that we give you in our review will actually guide you to uh, products that are possible and will warn you for the production of products that are not possible. So at the end, I would like to finish by saying that, especially to the 
young people in the audience, the most fascinating organisms you can actually work on are acetogens. They have a fascinating physiology. They can use different tricks that other anaerobes cannot do. You can play Lego with different uh, metabolic modules, and by doing so, you end up with promising production platforms for sustainable biotechnology. At the end, the hope is to have a biotechnology that is no longer based on fossil fuels, but can do the same with carbon dioxide. And Professor Islam, in the next talk, he will tell you how acetogens can be metabolically engineered and what the molecular toolboxes are for metabolic engineering in acetogens. With that, I would like to thank the co-workers that I mentioned along the talk. And you've seen that paper that I was citing from Alexander Katzev that appeared uh, also this year where you have many of these energetic calculations. We have a fruitful collaboration with the Göttingen Genomic Center, Rolf Daniel and Anja Pöhlein, and the funding of our project is by the European Research Council. With that, I thank you very much for your interest, and I'm giving back to Jan. Great, thank you very much, Volker. Very nice, very nice overview of this fascinating group of organisms. Um, please remember, if you have questions, type them in the type them in the question window. And we can continue with our next speaker. Uh, Asham, are you ready? Yeah. Uh, yep. Thank you for the invitation. Well, um, it's been a it's been a privilege to be able to allow the publication of our review in this journal. And today I was uh, invited to talk about this review paper. But um, I was kind of so essentially this is the review paper that he published um, in this sort of a thematic issue um, and then uh, with uh, with Volker and his PhD student we sort of uh, tried to um, manage talk about the genetic and metabolic engineering challenges of uh, acetogenic chassis. I would like to sort of try to go back and provide an overview of my previous experience with acetogens to give you a broader uh, sort of overview of why I think the um, why or how I am getting interested about the pseudogens. So uh, this is the outline of my today's presentation, as you can see. So first, I'm going to talk about my acquaintance with the pseudogens, sort of a personal view, uh, and how I got involved with whether it's a problematic thing or not. I'm not quite sure. Uh, well, uh, let's see uh, how that goes. And then the next thing uh, we're going to, I'm, I'm going to talk about the genetic and metabolic engineering challenges or the tools that are available for pseudogens and the tools that needs to be developed. Um, and also, um, finally, I'll show you some of the preliminary results from my PhD student's work, uh, who is probably in the audience today. Okay, so my, during my PhD, I uh, sort of got interested about these particular types of organisms who are very important for the bioremediation of toxic chlorinated compounds. So the toxic chlorinated compounds such as trichlorethane, tetrachlorethane, and vinyl chlorides, uh, these are known carcinogens, and these are widely used industrial degreasing agents. And when they're uh, thrown out in the environment, they sort of uh, ended up in the subsurface uh, groundwater contaminants, and they remain there very, for a very long time. So if you um, sort of leave a glass of chlorinated compounds uh, on your table and come back 100 years later, it remains pretty much like the same. Uh, so it's a very stable compound. Fortunately, these microorganisms, uh, these bacteria, the Helicococcus nakatiae, um, they can degrade these compounds and produce B9 compounds, B9 ethene. So the way they do is the following. So it's, it's kind of like a chemical process you can think of that you feed them these toxic chlorinated pollutants and they eat it, that up and produce these B9 or less toxic products. Okay. So how do they do this kind of thing? Well, the enzymes that are important and uh, catalyzing this particular reaction is called reductive dehalogenases. And those enzymes are essentially, you know, degrading this uh, sort of, uh, you know, step-by-step -step, uh, reductive uh, reduction reaction, and then dechlorinate uh, those higher chlorinated compounds into ethene, uh, and in other cases like higher aromatic compounds into lower aromatic compounds, and then there are other organisms which can take up these lower aromatic compounds and then convert them into uh, benign compounds like benign ethene. So now, 
as you could see that those organisms, the helicopters, although they are kind of like the main players, uh, they cannot do this work by themselves. Uh, usually they work in a community and a declinating community involves methanogens and acetogens. And as you could see, the acetogens play a very big role in uh, this declinating community where this dihelicocoides and a green geovector. So basically these are declinators that they sort of degrade uh, these chlorinated compounds. So in the uh, sort of uh, the microbial community, we uh, usually feed the methanol and then trichloroethane and then essentially you could see that the acetogens and also the methanogens, so the acetogens, they're converting methanol into hydrogen, uh, which uh, nicely, uh, Volker nicely mentioned about, you know, the conversion of methanol and, uh, and their production uh, by the acetogens and sort of the, uh, they also produce acetate. Now these acetate uh, are also being used by the dihelicocodate as the carbon source and then hydrogen as the energy source. So acetogens are uh, very central uh, to these organisms. And the other important thing is that these dihelicocodus bacteria, when they're degrading or they're reductive dehalogenase enzymes by which they degrade these toxic compounds, those enzymes require coordinate cofactors or the cobalamin cofactors, which are obviously, uh, they cannot produce themselves and they need help from acetogens. So acetogens are a very big player uh, in this diplomatic community. And that's how I got involved with this um, acetogenic metabolism and their understanding. So next, when I move into my postdoctoral research, uh, I saw, uh, I sort of tasked with this, uh, you know, uh, developing new community chemicals production uh, from gases. So sort of the vision that uh, will uh, try to, you know, replace this with this kind of organisms and convert these gaseous substrates into these commodity chemicals, or probably, you know, as an added uh, uh, sort of um, side by side with these um, uh, chemical industries, we can use these types of uh, smaller scale uh, fermenters probably, and then use the waste gases from them, and then use these uh, to produce this kind of uh, uh, products. So in order to do that, first, uh, this is the workflow that I tried to uh, follow. So essentially, we need to figure out the different types of, um, you know, biochemical reaction pathways first uh, that can be designed. And then uh, we need to uh, figure out that how we can design those pathways because once we design this, then you can implement synthetic biology or uh, you know, genetic engineering and ultimately metabolic engineering to produce these compounds. So uh, this is sort of the workflow that I tried to follow. Then the uh, chassis that I wanted to work on is obviously Morella thermocytica. Now, why is that? Because Morella thermocytica, uh, as uh, you know, uh, Volker mentioned in his presentation as well, is a fascinating organism, and it's it's a very hard to work organism as well. And uh, it has, as you can see, that the uh, metabolic diversity is really huge and it can uh, grow both autotrophically and heterotrophically and it can use um, a number of uh, different types of substrates. Um, so, you know, uh, there's the possibility that uh, you can use different types of substrates as feedstock to uh, convert them into different types of products. And at the same time, these are thermophilic uh, organisms, which is also industrially very important and relevant because the uh, thermophilic nature can actually uh, reduce the um, capital investment costs, like energetic cost by, uh, and also the uh, contamin medium contamination problem, uh, so, so on and so forth. So these are really useful organisms. So in order to understand more about the Morella thermocytica, I developed a genome scale uh, sort of the <clears throat> metabolic model in details where uh, this is shown here. And uh, so it, when I was building this model, at that point, Volker's paper uh, about this um, a different understanding of the biochemistry and by uh, different, uh, you know, the detailed explanation of those uh, biochemical pathways in the wood um, pathways and their energetics, those helped me a lot. And uh, I tried to implement some of those uh, techniques and some of those understandings uh, when I was developing this model and uh, analyzed all those with the help of the, uh, the, the novel pathways that I developed. So if you, uh, if, if you want to look at more about this uh, this paper, you can you can follow this um, and look at more details in in there. Now, 
the pathways that I tried to develop kind of leveraging the Udundal pathway of acetogens. Uh, so I was trying to use acetyl-CoA as my central or starting compounds and how you can convert that into my target compound ethylene glycol. So I was trying to follow this scheme where obviously, uh, you know, uh, this this pathway is already uh, in the organism and uh, i was trying to uh, figure out the two main hubs glycerol and ethanol and then uh, design the engineered pathway to convert them into black aldehyde and from which uh, there's another one step pathway that can convert to ethylene glycol so i followed this scheme and uh, tried to figure out uh, these different pathways which obviously starting from glycerol and then producing black aldehyde and uh, I can mention that as a pathway one, then I developed also pathway two. And pathway three is also starting from glycerate and going back here through hydroxypyruvate producing glycolaldehyde. And then finally, this pathway is pathway, uh, ethylene glycol pathway four, that is converting glycerate to l serine via hydroxypyruvate to glycolaldehyde. And then the next hub was um, our ethanol. So for ethanol, we have uh, identified I, I, three pathways. Uh, then of these three pathways, I mentioned them as five, six, seven. And after identifying these pathways, then the next step was I was uh, inserting those pathways into the Morella metabolic model and also this Clostridium lundale metabolic model. This two metabolic model, I was trying to identify to sort of uh, get a sense of which chassis um, can give better yield, molar yield uh, in terms of the pathways. So I was analyzing all those design pathways, the novel design pathways, as well as the pathways uh, that has been published and implemented in E. coli. So I was trying to uh, sort of take those pathways and insert them into, uh, into Morella as well as in uh, Clostridium Dundali and, and uh, identified uh, their moral yield. And as you could see from this figure that um, for the uh, molar yield on pathways on the CO carbon monoxide, um, so the Morella thermocytica is showing uh, a better results. Then similarly, I was trying to analyze their uh, molar yield on CO2 and hydrogen, and that also shows that uh, you know somewhat similar Morella is mostly the uh, you know better choice compared to the uh, Clostridium leonidae. So that sort of interested me uh, when I started my uh, independent position here at Loughborough University to sort of um, invest time and energy uh, to you know um, engineer the this pathways into Morella. And then there comes my uh, PhD student, Barbara Borget, uh, who is a, a really very um, industrious and hardworking PhD student. And I was looking for someone who can actually, you know, um, sort of hammering down these uh, ideas in, and inserting these, uh, um, you know, pathways into Morella. However, when we start working with Morella, we sort of hit the uh, a huge uh, wall, uh, sort of a brick wall, and we are trying to figure out how can, what technique or what should be the main bottlenecks and how can we approach those different types of bottlenecks. So we needed to uh, sort of figure out a systematic way and we was kind of thinking, well, probably we should address these challenges first, and then probably addressing these challenges step by step, we'll be able to develop a genetic system that could be ultimately be used for engineering those pathways. So we started from the very pre preliminary stage, and that sort of uh, you know encouraged or inspired us to come up with this review papers idea. And there we sort of discussed what we, we uh, sort of faced uh, during uh, this journey of engineering engineering Morella Thermocytica, basically. So we sort of uh, discussed how to overcome these different physical and biochemical barriers in order to uh, genetically engineer Morella. So first is uh, DNA transfer into an acetogenic host. Obviously, acetogens are all uh, gram-positive um, organisms, so their uh, cell layer is very thick, uh, so that's a big challenge. And then uh, for in terms of the Morella, there are also, uh, you know, Lipophilic organisms, so thermal stability of exogenous enzymes is another important issue. And then also, um, there are, uh, you know, when we started working with Morella, um, still uh, there is 
no genetic system uh, that is available through which you can use these replicating plasmids. So the gram-positive replicating plasmid is also uh, a very uh, big bottleneck, and it's also important because the replicating plasmid can be used for CRISPR-Cas applications as well. Right. So then the other things we also discussed about the optimization of different transformation protocol. Then we discussed about the methods for genetic manipulations. We sort of uh, divided them into manipulating gene expression as well as the methods uh, that are involved or used for modifying host genome. So in those two categories, then you can uh, have a detailed look at those uh, uh, discussion in, in the review paper. So now these are the sort of the figures that we presented in the reviews and said that, well, you know, the, what are the main barriers, as I just mentioned, alluded to you, that the, the gram positive barrier and the thermophilic requirements, as well as the, uh, you know, the requirement of a replicating plasmid. And another very important thing that we discussed is this uh, plasmid methylation, which is to evade or sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, due the uh, restriction modification systems of these organisms, which is uh, really a big problem, uh, you know, in order to engineer the acetogens. And then obviously we need to uh, we discuss the different transformation, uh, the different parameters that uh, that are need to be, um, you know, that are required to be optimized in order to get a good transformation efficiency. So then uh, again here. Uh, we discussed uh, different genetic manipulation tools uh, that could be used for you know uh, changing or manipulating gene expression levels so we discussed the promoters and rna based regulations and also discussed about the ribosome binding sites how can you uh, modify those and what are the tools that have been applied and that are available um, in, in in the review paper so uh, then finally, we also discussed about the, how can, uh, you know, what are the tools that could be used to achieve the genetic modification in Morella, uh, some of the newer tools uh, that, uh, for example, uh, the, obviously the CRISPR-Cas is really widely available for different organisms. However, for uh, acetogens in terms of, uh, in particular, Morella thermocytica, it is not yet developed. And then we sort of discussed what are the uh, challenges associated in developing uh, such tools for thermophilic organisms and what are the useful or sort of successful applications in terms of application of uh, CRISPR-Cas9 in Morella. So after discussing those, we also discussed about these different metabolic engineering efforts in acetogens and, and, and then uh, how uh, the different types of metabolic engineering techniques has been implemented so far and what are the uh, achievements in that area. So you can have a good look at um, in, in, the, um, in, in the paper. Then we also uh, pro uh, provided this kind of tables showing that uh, how and what types of gram-positive replicants has been used and engineered in acetogens, in different acetogens. And we also discussed, uh, you know, the genetic tools that are available for the acetogens. We provided uh, details um, the, of the different types of tools that have been implemented in acetogens, as well as, uh, you know, uh, that could be uh, potentially implemented. And finally, we also showed that uh, the metabolic engineering studies that have been implemented uh, in different acetogens. Uh, for example, as you could see here, that the ethanol production has been implemented in Morella thermocytica and also lactic production in Morella thermocytica. Right. Um, so now, finally, I'd like to share a few slides for the Morella thermocytica shuttle vector that we uh, tried to develop in, uh, in my lab, and then um, the Barbara uh, in, invested quite a, a huge amount of time. So we sort of tried to. Um, engineer gram-positive replicant from Thermotorga petrophila, and then also uh, inserted thermostable canamycin resistance genes. And this is sort of the uh, figure that shows this uh, PMTL, uh, PMTL KTP shuttle vector uh, that we developed. So that includes the uh, Thermotorga petrophila, this gram-positive replicant over here. And then this is the Morella thermostatic promoter. This is the thermostable canamycin resistance gene. And there's a gram-negative replicant is also provided here. And so that uh, you know you can insert both the uh, methyl transferase genes as well as the uh, your gene of interest in the same plasmid, so that you can first methylate using an E. coli methylation strain, uh, and then uh, insert this uh, methylated plasmid into the uh, Morella chassis. Okay, so these are the sort of we use that particular. Uh, 
PMTL uh, vector to express both the Morella thermocytica native ALDH gene uh, and also uh, Clostridium autoethanogenum and ADH gene. And these genes we express those because Morella thermocytica cannot produce natively ethanol. We're just trying to see if the promoters that we have developed is actually functional. And we have seen ethanol production. And interestingly, we have seen that when the culture is static, uh, it produced less ethanol compared to the agitated culture, which probably kind of shows that uh, that the the um, gas diffusion is really more efficient in the agitated culture or could be uh, uh, another thing. So finally, just to summarize that, as Volker mentioned nicely, is really the serogens are very important chassis for the biotechnological applications and uh, uh, more efficient genetic tools are required in order to uh, engineer them. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, for the metabolic engineering applications or for more industrial applications of it, definitely there is no alternatives to get better uh, genetic tools. Uh, so we sort of uh, uh, it, it started our journey towards that direction uh, by creating a replicating plasmid enabled genetic system for the Morella, uh, but more optimization of the developed system as required. And then finally, I just uh, like to acknowledge um, the the funding that I've received so far, um, and also. You know, uh, my collaborator, Dr. Nigel Minton, at the University of Nottingham, who provided a really good support uh, for uh, this project. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Hassan, and thank you very much, Volker. This was a great experience, actually. So, for the the people who are listening, both articles are open access, as far as I can see. So, you should be able to enjoy yourself by reading this in detail and finding your way through it and be carefully edited so that they should be comprehensible to all non-specialists like myself and enjoy <laughs> a lot on this thing. So there's a, quite a number of, of questions. Some of them are very detailed. I, maybe I, as a chairman, I would like to um, uh, take up with a, a very general question. Like, um, I mean, either Hassan or Volker can, can reply to this depending on what they think. So, is there a realistic industry interest in this biotechnology? And if not, what does it take that, that this principle takes off at a wider scale? I mean, we all hope to go to a bio-based economy and have biotechnology that replaces petroleum, right? But so is this is this already being implemented or what will it take? Yes, there is industrial interest and not only interest, for example, there's a, um, the I would say the world leading company Lancertech has a couple of demonstration plants and is now building production plants in China and one in Belgium and in Ghent. Um, of course, at the moment, um, um, we cannot compete with uh, ethanol produced from uh, by yeast from uh, uh, sugars, let's say. Um, but this is a matter of uh, time and price and political willingness. So we are. We are facing one of the greatest challenges in, uh, in, in, his, in, in human history, the global warming. And if you, if you want to combat global warming, we have to reduce CO2 emissions and we have to find a way to reduce the CO2 concentration. And this is one of the ways. So by, let's say, political willingness to, to enforce that, if you, for example, increase the prices for carbon dioxide, then this process becomes uh, compatible and doable. And apart from Lancertec, there are companies actually working on it. And as you've heard in the, in the second talk, the molecular toolbox is steadily increasing. So metabolic engineering is possible. And uh, Azan has a couple of examples in his review where, where it is shown that uh, value-added compounds can be produced. So yes, there are companies interested. For my feeling, there could be more companies interested. Um, but uh, that is, I would say, a matter of time. So, and, and to, to ask so, so how much is this limited by, you know, the fact that you have, that you're using natural strains and genetically modified strains would make a real killer advantage? Or is it just slight optimizations? Or is it a reluctancy to use genetically modified strains in industry? What is the barrier there for your progress? 
So uh, I would say um, I don't think there's a, a sort of um, you know huge um, op, sort of uh, you know problem in terms of using genetically modified organisms because these are mainly used for biochemical productions or biologics productions. Um, I think the main barrier here is to get an optimized cell factory. At, at an optimized cell factory that can compete with, um, you know, in terms of the uh, productivity or in terms of the titer. Because uh, when um, you try to uh, place your case uh, and take your case to an industrialist, all they try to look at pretty much like what is the, um, you know, the titer, whether it's the viable industrially, and if I'm making a huge uh, plant, uh, would I be able to, uh, you know, get a break even or something those kind of something like that now for that point of view i think the upstream engineering uh, challenges is really huge uh, because if we can have a really good uh, optimized cell factory through developing good genetic tools uh, obviously that can increase the productivity and titer which can ultimately sort of uh, you know translate into uh, other sort of engineering challenges sort of downstream challenges but those downstream challenges will be uh, less complicated if we can uh, sort of enhance our efforts in the uh, upstream development but uh, going back to that questions that Volker nicely answered that you know Lanza Tech is really uh, showing the way of going forward towards this direction. Uh, however, I think if you just uh, simply think about, uh, for example, I was working at, during my postdoc, I was working with the Saudi uh, Aramco Basic Industries Corporation, right, the Saudi. So they are kind of like sitting on oil and the question is, why do they are interested about these green chemicals and this kind of uh, you know technologies? So the reason is, Everyone is trying to look at from different angles whether these technologies are uh, you know viable, whether there could be an opportunity out there. Now all these things uh, are really uh, sort of interesting because if you're thinking about can we compete with these bulk industries? Well, if you think about that, we cannot compete directly. However, if you think about from the selectivity point of view, selectivity of catalysts, selectivity of biochemical systems then definitely there's a huge opportunity for this system and definitely we are the future is towards this direction so right so one of the questions in the uh in the forum is for example uh it's a question from abantika gosh who asks about the low growth rates of acetogen so how can you overcome the low growth rates of acetogen for industrial purposes is this is this a real issue this is a real issue of course this is a real issue however uh, what we could try to do uh, we are uh, you know obviously trying to achieve uh, different metabolic engineering techniques by providing different types of uh, you know substrates and different uh, changing the media composition and this and that however now there are some uh, inherent limitations, some thermodynamic limitations, which we cannot overcome, definitely. But if we are trying to implement sort of the different uh, strategy, for example, one strategy is the mixotrophy. If we can implement both mixotrophy, how can we sort of try to uh, use both glucose substrates as well as the uh, gaseous substrates, combine them together, activating both the autotrophic and heterotrophic metabolism, combine them and enhance their uh, growth rate. Well, uh, these techniques have been um, sort of explored and also, uh, as I said, it's working with anaerobes uh, takes patience. And that's one of the reasons why at the beginning of my talk, I sort of tried to uh, allude towards this point whether it is a good choice or bad choice whether working with Morella, uh, you know, especially if you're a new faculty thinking about your tenure and other stuff. But I'm really fascinated about this organism because this is uh, sort of the, the, the types of organisms uh, because of their embedded wood lundal pathway, the CO2 fixing pathway, which is the uh, thermodynamically the most efficient non photosynthetic pathway, carbon fixing pathway. So Going back to the question, can it be achieved to, um, you know, the enhance the growth rate? Well, it can be achieved that is sort of bounded by the thermodynamic limit. 
if we try to compete with E. coli or yeast, well, definitely we are not going there. However, it has other advantages. Yeah, sure, sure. So to get to this industrial side of things in terms of the product outputs, there's also several questions about that. So first, maybe a question of Stephen Daniel who asks to Volker, like, okay, if you're going to produce, uh, <laughs> if you're going to produce something, like, what's the maximum concentration of methanol that can be tolerated by uh, by uh, acid reactive uni and other acetogens? That is a uh... This question can't be can't be answered that, that that easily. So there is a nice study on the uh, methanol adaptation of growth of acetogens to methanol. So you can adapt it over time, and then they would tolerate more. But the tolerance is not one has to say not very high in the unadapted state. For example, in Acetobacterium woodii, we are talking about a couple of hundred millimolar, so not uh, not molar concentrations. And uh, uh, even the adaptation system, you would not get uh, uh, very high. So, for example, if you compare this to ethanol, at the beginning, um, um, people thought that bacterial ethanol producer may, be a, may have a higher tolerance compared to yeast, but this turned out not to be true. There's an intrinsic property, and this intrinsic property is determined by the cytoplasmic membrane. So, at a certain point, and all these cytoplasmic membranes are, in principle, organized the same way, the cytoplasmic membrane collapses, and then it's the end of the story. Okay, and there's a, there's a, a question also related to production from Anke Neumann, who asked, like, is ethanol really the preferred product, and what about acetate as an intermediate, and if you would use a second stage fermentation, can you produce other by high volume products, or is there any thermodynamic feasibility or so, or limitation? To, to do this? So the first part is ethanol the preferred product? No, it is not. Um, 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 if acetylens want to produce ethanol, they have to have uh, certain enzymes called AOR. And what they do usually is they do produce acetate first, thereby they produce the ATP in the Wood-Jungner pathway that I described. And then they re use reduced ferrodoxin to um, reduce acetate back to ethanol. Um, ethanol producing acetogens do have the AOR system. Acetobacterium woodii does not, and it cannot produce ethanol, only acetate. So one way of producing, of making ethanol producers would be to put in the AOR plus an aldehyde uh, dehydrogenase. So ethanol is not the preferred product because cells lose normally, if you would go, from acetyl-CoA to acetaldehyde and then to ethanol, cells would lose one ATP. Only if they can use the AOR, then they have the same amount of ATP, let's say, left. But then they need additional reductant. This, the second part of the question was, if actually you would use acetate as an intermediate and then use a second stage fermentation to produce high value products. Yes, that, that is a very interesting idea. And um, 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 companies are interested in the the group of uh, Dr. Leumann, I guess, has uh, um, um, research on it and papers on it. So what you could imagine is a two-step process where, for example, the acetogen produces acetate first, and then you feed this to a yeast. Yeast is uh, pH tolerant, grows at low pHs, and eats the acetate and produces some goodies out of it. If you want to do the same with, let's say, just one um, a group of uh, with the acetogen that that uh, would not work. There's a couple of acetogens that could uh, oxidize acetate, but uh, very poorly. What you could do is uh, experiments, for example, that Lars Angen is doing very elegantly. Also, a chain elongation. They produce acetate. You feed acetate from the outside, and then they would produce C4, C5, C6. So that that could be done by feeding acetate to uh, um, Clostridia. So that exact same method that Volker you described, we sort of implemented when I was in uh, Greg Stephanopoulos' group. Uh, we uh, sort of produced, uh, used Morella to produce acetate and then feed that acetate into Euroia lipolytica to produce uh, you know, um, the, the fats and uh, in, in, uh, in large amount. And we tried to also, uh, we, showed how you can uh, 
sort of manage or we, we call this a doping technique, uh, sort of um, manage the uh, substrate, co-fit the substrate and manage their metabolism and enhance their growth rate. Uh, and in that case, we pretty much used uh, wild type acerogens, uh, wild type Morella thermocytica, wild type Eurovia. So just to manage the substrate concentration by feeding, uh, you know, how to change the feed concentration by managing those, we were able to show uh, really nicely that you can have a good uh, high titer and good yield. So that paper we published in, um, uh, in Nature Metabolism, uh, it was in last year. So it's, it's, it's a nice example showing how you can use uh, acetogens acetate into uh, as an intermediate and then produce a high value products in the second yeah. fermentation. There's a, a comment also here uh, by Michelle Gradley who says that who, who was a CTO for an industry in the UK uh, and she's mentioned that the, one of the biggest problems in implementation here is the scale up costs for the fermentations and the gas fermentation because it requires so much basic financial investment. So yeah, she says great benefits but high risk of failure because of investment challenges. Yeah, that, that's a very useful comment, uh, comment I think, but uh, yeah. Maybe and then that one could comment. think about switching to methanol. So it's, e it's sort of easy to produce methanol from syngas and then you don't have all these technical problems anymore. Yeah. So you can yeah. use the same box uh, to convert methanol that comes from syngas. Yeah. But this is true. This is one of the biggest factors in implementing such a such a system. Yeah. yeah. Actually, as as a microbiologist, I have a question for for you as well. So, Volker, if you say that there's so many different possibilities, these Legos that these acetogens can do, is there any evidence that they also do job sharing in a in a population? So that some bacteria, some cells do this, and another cell does that, or is that not possible thermodynamically? I mean, it's yeah. known for other bacteria that there is job sharing, you know, not everybody is doing the same. Single, some single cells can do more of this and others do more of that. Is that possible for acetogens? Um, I don't know. Um, there's no studies on that topic. Um, uh, people my age, we, are, we were trained to work with pure cultures. Um, and now the mixed cultures, this is a very hot topic, but there's very little studies, at least that I know, on acetogens. Um, it's still, you look it's still a pure culture, eh? but it's just individual cells doing different things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you grow a population of bacillus, they will, you know, diff do different things. Yeah, I know, but uh, I guess here, no, I don't know anybody that has actually looked okay. at that. And I guess okay. for that, I'm not a geneticist, but I would guess for that you need a much better genetic toolbox. You need some sort of uh, fluorescent markers to see differences in cells in one population. But thermodynamically, I, I would not see a problem. No, that, for example, this uh, sharing of hydrogen uh, that could work also with cells of the same species in one population. Right. So would you be ready for some more technical questions on like metabolic pathways, thermodynamics and so on? Yes, I guess. So there is a question from Chen Zhang who asks, if I interpret collect, uh, correctly, are there cases that formates can be directly converted to NADH rather than through hydrogen? Yes. I'm not sure if that's... So the, the, due to the lack of time, I couldn't describe the fascinating variety of biochemistry of acetogens. Acetogens are not a phylogenetic group. You, you could see this from the different names already. Um, there's 23 described genera at the moment. And the overall principle is the same. It's 2CO2 to 1 acetate, but the enzymes involved and the electron carriers involved are very different. So the enzyme that I was showing that produces hydrogen, we, we discovered that and we named this hydrogen-dependent CO2 reductase. The classical enzyme would be a formate dehydrogenase. And cells that oxidize formate, they can have formate dehydrogenases coupled to NAD, coupled to NADP, coupled to ferrodoxin. Um, they can have uh, different cofactors. Formate dehydrogenases that work in the direction of CO2 reduction cannot work with NAD because this is thermodynamically restricted, but they could work with ferrodoxin or NADP. And the group of Rolf Tower, they also described electron bifurcating formate dehydrogenases that work together in context with hydrogenases. 
in which um, NAD and ferredoxin are used as electron donor. So there's a huge variety of different format dehydrogenases. Um, the enzyme that was on my slide, the HPCR, that has been found biochemically in two species, in Cetobacterium and in Thermo Enerobacter kivui, and from the genome in, let's say, around 10, 15, 20 other species, but many, many acetogens have classical format dehydrogenases. All right, great, thank you. And then there's a, a question to, uh, to Asam. Um, from uh, Lucas Perret, who asks uh, if the genome manipulation or engineering that you are intending or that you have done so far already, does it have any stability on the strains in fermentation processes? Now, we haven't been explored that far, to be honest. We still kind of like, the, as I said, we are still preliminary stages of this development. Uh, and one of the problems with this uh, uh, you know, the optimization of the development of the genetic tools is to make sure that, you know, the uh, mutant that we are developing or uh, the change that we are trying to impart into the HSE is stable. So those uh, areas we haven't explored yet, uh, but uh, we are still, as you can see, that's our next step. So uh, I cannot answer uh, right now. Uh, uh, that's fair enough. I'm, I'm reading the questions here. <laughs> Good. And there's a question for uh, Volker from uh, Ari Satanowski. He says, thanks for the fantastic talk, fascinating metabolism. I have wondered for some time why apparently in nature the methyl uh, methylene, uh, methylene tetrahydrophyllate pathway is exclusively converted to acetyl-CoA via methyl tetrahydrophyllate and uh, carbon monoxide dehydrogenase. And why is there not a glycine synthase glycine reductase pathway? In, is there some more dynamic reasons for this? This is a very detailed question of a knowledgeable person. Uh, yes, there, so the glycine synthase, glycine reductase pathway is sort of a bypass to the wood lungal pathway. And mm -hmm. indeed, there is a, a recent publication from our Korean uh, friends that demonstrated that this pathway does exist in, for example, Clostridium, if I remember that correctly, Drake, Yes, it does exist. And this pathway has also been elaborated by the group of Alfons Stamms in uh, the Sulfovibrio species and was postulated by Aaron Bar even for some acetogens. Yes, this pathway does exist solo, but also in combination with the Wood-Jungler uh, pathway, at least in some. So the, en the enzymes are not present for the glycine synthase or glycine reduction in, for example, Acetobacterium woody eye. But some okay. do have that. Great. So there's a few questions that ask uh, about acetogens in environmental conditions. So um, uh, Abiyet Singh is asking uh, to either of you, like, how would you study acetogens in the environment, like in biogas systems, where they will be mixed with, with other bacteria? Well, that is a very general question. So the it's a, it's a question is on how to detect by molecular probe acetogens in a system. That is sort of difficult. People thought about that for a long time. And uh, I guess I'm not a microbial ecologist, I guess, but the molecular probe that people use is on the uh, formula tetrahydrofolate synthase gene enzyme. With that, people, I guess, think that they can detect acetogens in environmental um, samples. If you, if you want to study acetogenesis in environmental samples by classical techniques, you, you take a microcosm, for example, put in radioactive CO2 and see whether you find radioactive acetate. And by labeling experiment, you do find out whether this acetate is produced by the wood jung pathway. So you can actually detect this biochemically. And with molecular probes, I'm not sure, but I guess uh, there are ways to do that. Right. Okay. And do they play any other roles in the environment? I mean, their numbers must be reasonably so dependent one on of, fermentation. One of, the, one of the things that I mentioned in my presentation, uh, as you have seen probably, uh, that acetogens, when I was working with this dechlorinating microbial community, they sort of supply the corinoids or cobalamins because acetogens are kind of like a uh, they 
they are kind of like a co uh, coronoid factory and they can produce more than 30, 40 different types of co uh, coronoid factors. And these are really, uh, these cobalamins are really very important uh, sort of, um, you know, metal ions. And pseudogens uh, can play a big role uh, in this kind of, you know, declinating microbial communities. Uh, from my experience, that's what I've noticed. So definitely these communities, uh, we sort of uh, studied on, uh, we collected these communities from the um, from the contaminated sites in microbial uh, that are contaminated with this uh, TCC, uh, this dechlorinating compound or this uh, chlorinated solvent contaminated sites. And naturally, uh, we have seen that there are acetogens out there. So definitely, uh, the acetogens are playing a big role. And obviously, you know, uh, one thing that if, if if you think about that. Uh, sort of their origin, this kind of like a soil bacteria. So definitely, you know, if you think about their origin, then they can play a different types of roles in, in, in the microbial ecology as well. Right, okay. Maybe a last question by Frank Bengelsdorf, who asks to Volker, thanks for the great talk introducing the Lego module contact. Today, you haven't talked about the role of electron bifurcating transhydrogenases, NUN. In some acetogens, the respective enzymes are known, and in some, the respective genes have not been found. Could you please speculate if all acetogens would need such an enzyme, or if they could make a living without enzymes such as NEN or NUN? Um, yes, um, electron bifurcating uh, transhydrogenases are known in the cetogens, well known in the cetogens, and we have currently two classes. One class is the NFN. So what is for the general audience, Dr. Bengelsdorf is an expert in the field. Um, for the general audience, what is a transhydrogenase? The transhydrogenase is an enzyme that interconverts NADP uh, and um, NAD um, with reduced ferrodoxin as a mediator, let's say. The transhydrogenase in E. coli is also present, and in E. coli, the transhydrogenase uses the membrane potential to drive the reduction of NADP with NADH as reductant. So that is the reaction that is important, and it is the more important if the wood lumbar pathway has an enzyme that is NADP dependent. So then you have to have a way to make NADP from NAD, and therefore. Um, all the bugs that have NADP-dependent enzyme in the wood lumbar pathway have to have a transhydrogenase. And of course, these cells have to make biosynthesis. This is what I always tell my students. If you look at the wood lumbar pathway, this is just the pathway to produce ATP when they grow autotrophically. But of course, they have to make biosynthesis of lipids, of DNA, of uh, carbohydrates, of all this kind of stuff. And so therefore, you need NADP. And currently we know the NFN type transhydrogenase. And then we discovered and published uh, uh, also the first author on that paper, Florian Kremp, just, uh, published a paper on a novel type of transhydrogenase, which we called Spuromusa type uh, transhydrogenase STN. So the answer to that question is yes, uh, transhydrogenases are required for the acetogens. Every acetogen looked at has a transhydrogenase, and the transhydrogenase can be either of the NFN or STN type. Great. I think we will stop here. This was a great experience. I thank you very much, Athan and, and Volker. This was uh, extremely interesting to listen to. Uh, it's also a very lively field. Uh, I thank the audience for the very lively discussion as well. Uh, it looks like a field that, that is really growing in importance even more. Uh, and I hope that several of your ideas will make it to industry applications so that we can work on, on climate and better chemistry and production and so on. That is all very good for our future in that sense.